grammar is an, is an interesting thing in how people speak, how they talk, how they write, how they communicate with one another. And, um, you know, I wanted to start this morning talking about contractions, not the pregnancy type. So, yeah, she's not in here. Okay, we just don't want anybody going into early pregnancy. But anyway, is she two weeks out? She's two weeks out, okay. So we're talking about contractions this morning, and um, they're interesting the way that they look on paper, especially the word don'ts. And and when I was working on this series and looking this up, I was like, well, how exactly do you spell the word don'ts? And so I did a little research and figured out that that's that's the right way to spell it, but it still doesn't even look 100% right. But contractions, and we're going to have a little bit of 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 a literature lesson here, a little bit on our grammar. Contractions are basically two words crammed together, and they form one word. So it's, it's interesting um, in some of these things. So instead of having to say, do not, it's easier just to say, don't. That was the idea, after all. Um, in the English language, they decided that, that putting these words together would make communication easier. Make it a little more simple to talk with one another. The idea is that you can get the point across a little faster if you can use these contractions. Uh, Fewer words that we have to say. For example, cannot, can't, I am, I'm, we are, we're, how do, how'd. It's a pretty simple notion. When you stop and think about it, when, when you really look at this in, in, in contrast of a normal conversation, is it really that much faster to say we're than we are? Is it really that much faster to say can't and cannot? So it's not necessarily the speed at which we speak. It's the way that we articulate. Some are a little better at articulation than others. Some you really have to listen to, but but when you break it down, it really has to do with the syllables. How many syllables are you saying when, when you say these words without the contractions? Can, not, can't, I, am, I'm, we, are, we're, how, do, how'd. So the concept is pretty simple for those of you who are Elementary school teachers, you can you feel free to use this in a lesson. Uh, just you can download it from the online. And why is Ellen laughing at me again? Is that you? It's no Rick. Was it no? Okay. The idea is that we make things simple, right? We make it we make it easy to communicate with one another. But it can sometimes come at a cost. What do I mean by that? Well, sometimes in our our effort of making things easy, we can sometimes miss the meaning, right? It can get a little confusing. If I were to ask Josh to stand up and spell the word there, what did I mean? It could be there, they are, over there, it's there, right? There's a number of different ways that this could play out. How about the word weave? Could it be... We have, you could be weaving a basket. I don't know. Any basket weavers in here? Nobody? Cameron, you weave baskets? Awesome. But our, in our attempt to make life easy in this area, we tend to make it more difficult. And it's not just a problem with grammar. We have this same problem in our faith. As believers in Christ, we, we have grown up in a system that, that is quick to say, don't do this, and don't do this, and don't do that, and don't do this, and don't do that, and don't do that. Many of us growing up through the church, we've, we've seen that, we've heard that, we've said that from time to time. And when you're faced with the never-ending question, and for those of you that have little kids or have had little kids, you know this question. When you say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, they go, why? Why? Many times, instead of an in-depth explanation as to why, 
we offer probably one of two cliche comes back, comebacks. And one of those is, because I said so. Or possibly, because the Bible says so. Why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? Because the Bible says so. Hmm. For those of you who, who have read the sermon title, The Don'ts of the Faith, you've probably picked up on the fact that this is going to be a series. And, and you know that I enjoy doing uh, series, and, 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 I, and I've, I've had this one, I've been working on this one for a long time. Josh, you know, when I, when I first presented this idea, it was before the end of the last year, I said, I have a sermon series I'm going to start working on, and I told him what it was called. He's like, I can't wait for that. So he's, he's been excited for this one. But this is called the Don'ts of the Faith, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to look over the next few weeks at some of the hot topic issues with things that the church says, don't do this. Some of those things are going to include drinking, alcohol, not water, dancing, cussing, gambling, and tattoos. And some of you are going, oh my. <laughs> my hope, I have a reason for doing this, I promise I do. My hope in studying this is that some of us will have our eyes opened a little bit to some of the background as to why we say don't do these things. That some of this would, would open our eyes a little bit to the understanding of, of what the principles are and were in God's Word as to why we have said all these years, don't do these things. Some of us will be shocked when you read God's Word and you find out exactly what it says about some of these hot topic issues. Now, with that being said, we, 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 we need to keep in mind that the Bible is the Bible. It is the infallible, never-changing, living Word of the Lord. There's no contradictions in the entire Bible, and, and we're going to talk about that in, in another series in coming months. But I'm excited about going through this. I'm excited about walking through these, these different topics and, and really dissecting why we as the church... Believe what we do and say what we do. So with that being said, I would ask that you would turn with me to the book of Romans. We're going to be in chapter 7 this morning. And we're going to find Paul talking about decisions. We're going to find Paul as he struggles with some decisions that he had been making. So stand with me if you would this morning as we read it's Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. He says, For I do not understand my own actions. Can anybody relate already? I'm, I'm with him. For I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this morning. God, I pray that you would challenge us and charge us as we celebrated this baptism this morning, Lord, to remind each and every one of us that we have a job to do, Lord, and that is to seek the lost and to share the gospel with them. Lord, I pray as we study your word, Lord, as we begin this series in the coming weeks, Lord, that you would bless our study, that you would bless our worship together. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. 
So part of this, and we, and we talk briefly, this is the classic lesson, and this is the classic uh, discussion that Paul kind of has with his, his, himself over self-control, or the lack thereof, I should say, and, and, and his choice on whether or not he should sin. Obviously, Paul, us included, we don't want to sin. We don't desire to sin. We don't oftentimes set out to sin. But we do. We still struggle. Paul, Paul in, 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 his, in his little discourse here, basically what he's saying is, I don't understand myself. I want to do what's right, but instead, I do the very thing that I hate to do. It seems to be a fact of life that when I do what's right, inevitably, or when I want to do what's right, inevitably, I do what's wrong. How many of us can relate to this idea and this concept of, we know what's right, we know what's wrong, we want to do right, we desire to do right, but we find ourselves doing wrong. It's an issue of, of, it's a condition of who we are as humans, first of all. But it's an issue of self-control. Paul is, is desperately pleading with his readers to understand this concept, that this is a problem. There's a battle between flesh and, and, and the spirit that takes place on, on, on a daily basis. And for many of us, it's because of this lack of, of, of self-control in certain areas that, that, that we try to put up safeguards or ways that we can keep ourselves from vulnerable situations, so to speak. And, and, and we really practice that with, with, with our students in, in, in the ministry, and, and, and you practice that with your children as you want to try to, to set them up to succeed in, in so many ways and try to help them avoid the temptations that they could find themselves in. It's, it's interesting, I was talking with... with one of our church members this week, and, and they made a, we were talking about this, and they made a really good point, and, and, and they basically said, yes, some people are more prone to being addicted to, to maybe drinking or to drugs or to various things, but unless they try it, they don't know that they're prone to be addicted to it. So the idea is stay away from it. And how very, very true were those words. Anything that we can do to help ourselves to not find ourselves in these positions, that's what we need to focus on, to stay away. If you've talked with anybody about anything, whether it was faith or the weather or anything at all, in the last 20 years, you've, you've probably realized that when you make a statement or you make a point or you come up with a theory or you come up with this idea, a lot of times people aren't just okay with you expressing that. They want to know why. Why do you think this way? Why do you feel this way? Why do you believe this way? People want an explanation these days. Well, I, as, as many as other pastors and theologians, and teachers and parents, and we have a, a, a belief as to why things have, have gotten so questionable. Is that a good way to put that? Over the past handful of years. And, and, and I've talked about this briefly before. And, and, and as we set this series up today, I, I knew that, that, that we were having Lord's Supper and, and, and baptism. And so um, as, as I wanted to take just a few minutes this morning and set this up. But, but as we talk through these things, I think it's important for us to kind of understand what the world's like right now. For America, anyway. And, and, and so what I want to do is I want to do a real brief generational breakdown. And like I said, I did this when I very first came. We talked very briefly about some, some different generations and, and some mindsets and some thoughts behind why they do what they do. And so we're going to hit those real quick. And, and, and the first one we're going to talk about is the silent generation, or it's also known as the greatest generation, roughly 1927 to 1945. If you were born in those years, you're part of this generation. Well, what, what are some of the attributes? We're looking at only behavior. That's all that we're looking at this morning. And, and by and large, those that were, that were born in this generation are very submissive when it comes to authority figures. Somebody would tell them to do something, they would do it. You don't question. You don't back talk. You don't argue. You do it because you were told to do it. We fast forward a few years to the baby boomers, 1946 to 1964. 
extremely industrious generation, uh, had high, high respect for authority. They followed the rules. This is how the world works. We plug into the world. We, we work with the world. That's what we do. Then we hit the Generation Xers. That would be me. A couple of other you in here. And, and just, just barely on, on, on my part. I'm just barely a Gen Xer. They're born between 1965 and 1980. Gen- Generation Xers didn't necessarily like authority, by and large. Not everybody. But we would question authority. We'd want to know some answers, but we wouldn't push it far enough to be a problem. We wouldn't take it far enough to where there was a major explosion. We would question the authority, and then we would submit. And then along comes the Generation Y. These are the millennials. And this isn't everybody. Please hear me. This isn't everybody. This, this is the general stereo, stereotype of, of, of the age breakdowns of how this works. 1981 to the year 2000. If you were born in that time, you, you're considered a millennial. And so, so Josh and I, we, we, we come on the coattails of the millennials. and They're commonly referred to as Generation Y. Did you get that? Why? 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 Why is it this way? Why is it that way? Why do you do it this way? Why does the world work this way? Why? Unlike the Gen Xers who asked that question, the millennials would hear the answer by and large, and they'd say, eh, I don't think so. And they did their own thing. We have seen that the millennials are what many people refer to as game changers. They have changed the game, so to speak, as to how the world, and we're talking mainly about North America, how, how we function. They, um, they read the rule book on why and how things are done, and then they, they kind of threw it aside and said, I think we can, we can tweak this. We can make this a little bit better. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. Please don't hear me saying that this is a horrible thing, that this generation comes along and says, let's change the things. That's not necessarily a bad thing. And some things many of us will agree, needed some tweaking. Some things needed worked on. Generation Z, they're currently the ones being born right now, 2000 and beyond. They'll probably stop that in the next couple of years. Not babies being born, but being Generation Z. And um, we really don't know exactly what they're going to be like. I have my thoughts on what that generation is going to be called. Um, but we'll see that play out in, in the years to come. But there is one overarching theme that we can see, whether, whether you agree with all, all the, the thoughts on that, and, that, and that's not just, just, just me, that, that's a number of people, whether you agree with those thoughts on, on every point or not, we can't deny the fact that the respect for authority and plugging into the system is, is dwindling away. We're seeing this, this overarching disrespect. You can say people aren't doing what, what they're told to do anymore. Well, that's, that's one way of putting it. It's not enough. It's not enough anymore. And this, and this is what we're getting at with, 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 with this whole thing, is it's not enough anymore to just simply say, this is why it is, because I said so. This is why it is, because this is the way the world is. The generations that we're seeing come up and come through at this point, they don't want to hear that. They're going to go, why? 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 Why is it this way? Why do you think this way? Why do you believe this way? Why does the church tell us that we can't do these things? Why is it so bad? We as the church, we can't get by anymore with just saying, because... The Bible, my preacher said so. The pastor said we can't do it. The Bible says that we can't do it. I'm sure it does. I'm sure the Bible says we can't do it. It doesn't work anymore. The world, they want an explanation. It's kind of a scary thought if you think about it. 
If we as the church aren't willing to step up and give them a godly, scriptural, biblical definition and explanation of the why, then guess who will stand up and give them the definition, the description? The world. I don't know about you, but I don't like the idea of a non-believer explaining the Holy Scriptures to somebody when they themselves don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. Which brings us to our series. So why did I name our first lesson in all of this? Why? Because I believe there was some explanation that needed to be given. Why are we talking about the don'ts of the faith? Why do we bring this up? Because, ladies and gentlemen, God is calling us to go out into the world and to continue to spread and to share his gospel, even in the midst of what a lot of us see as deterioration. We see things collapsing. We're going to talk about what we as a church are supposed to do in just a second. As Christians this morning, there's a couple things that we need to make sure we're doing, and I'll work through these quickly. I know, I know what time it is. But as Christians, we need to be clear. We need to be clear on who we are, our beliefs, our convictions. We need to make sure that people know what we believe. Now, don't uh, don't get me wrong here. The outside world knows. They know what we believe. They think they know what we believe. And if you ask them, they'll probably recite it to you with some arrogance and a little bit of a smug look because really what they're saying is a church is full of hypocrites. It's full of people that think they're better than everybody else. They try to cast down judgments and dispersions on people who aren't a member of their church. In our defense, we are only trying to do what God tells us to do and live godly, biblical lives. That's all we're trying to do. Our call in and throughout this process of us being Christians is to share the gospel. It's to let people know what the Bible says. It's to let them know what God says is and is not appropriate. And while we may not have meant to come across as cynical or arrogant or or unsympathetical, many of us have. Over the years, many of us have been just those things to people. The outside world, by and large, believes that the church is simply here to be judgmental, to be self-focused, a building full of a bunch of better than yous. The local church nowadays is known more for what it's against than what it's for. What's it for? It's for sharing the gospel. It's for leading the lost to Christ. What's it for? It's for baptizing in the name of Jesus. We're called to seek the lost. We're called to share the gospel. And we have to be clear in what it is that we're doing. The second thing is we have to be transparent. Yes, there is a difference between being clear and transparent. And I will do my best to explain that to you. Being clear means that our beliefs, our direction, our initiatives, the core principles and values of who we are as believers in Christ have to be known and understood. That's being clear. Being transparent means that even in the midst of those principles and those core beliefs, the things by which we live our lives, we are going to make mistakes. We're going to drop the ball. We're going to let people down. Paul says it in what we read this morning. I don't understand my own actions. We know what we're supposed to do but many, many times we don't do it. And everyone in this world, everyone in this world, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you go to church or not, everybody makes mistakes, right? Everybody drops the ball. The saved, the lost, the very lost, it doesn't matter. We all are human. We're all going to to mess up from time to time. But the difference 
The difference is that, unfortunately, we are put under a microscope. Because we're the Christians. We're the ones who are supposed to be doing it right. And when we don't, we get a little check put by our names. Well, they're a Christian, and they're supposed to be doing it this way. I talk with a lot of people, and inevitably, me being a pastor comes up, and they usually say something like this, and this is really funny, but it usually is always the same way. It's, oh, well, you're a pastor? Well, you seem like a really down-to-earth guy. Thank you. And they're usually like, well, I, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Not you, but, but other people are hypocrites in the church. You would be surprised at the number of times that very conversation has played out. And I usually shake my head and I say, you're right. Church is full of hypocrites. And if you come to my church, you're going to find out that I'm the biggest hypocrite in my congregation. And they usually look at me really funny like, well, that's a weird thing to say. Why? Because it flies in contrast of their beliefs that we think we're better than everybody else. What is transparency? The best way I can explain it is this. Church, if you put your faith in me, if you put your faith in your pastor, you will be let down. I'm sorry. It will happen. That's transparency. We as the church have to be transparent to our community. It doesn't mean that we try to hide our failures and our faults. It means that when we have our failures and we have our faults and we fall to the ground, we let it be visible so that the outside world can see who helps us get back up. That's the point. To hide our imperfections will only cause us to be less clear on what we believe. Finally, this morning, as Christians, we need to be engaging. We need to engage our community. We need to go. If you guys remember our worship series with Isaiah, and and, and God said to him, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. The key word being go, not stay. We are to go out into our community. We're to share about who God is. Too many churches, in their defense, they're they're seeing this deterioration that everybody sees. And the ethical and moral values of our country is deteriorating. They see this and they close the doors. And they say, we don't want that outside influence coming in here. We don't want it. I get it. I understand it. But the door's supposed to work the other way. We're supposed to open the door and go out there and influence the world. Not the other way around. We can't do that. We can't do that if we don't know what the Bible says. We can't do that if we just say, oh, well, you're a drinker? Well, don't drink. The Bible says not to. It's not going to get you anywhere these days. It's through a personal relationship, growing and developing with people, being clear with them, being transparent to them. Let them see your faults and failures. Let them see how you get back up. The reality is if if we're to be opening our doors and stepping out in the world, we need to be influencing that world with Jesus Christ, period. You can't do that if we're not clear. We can't do that if we're not transparent. We can't do that if we're not willing to engage the lost. I'll leave you this morning with um, a final bit of truth. And I always try to leave messages on an encouraging note. And this isn't necessarily discouraging, but I say this. We need to understand that we are fighting an uphill battle. We are going in against the odds. They're not in our favor. It won't be easy, but we're still called to go. I'm going to ask that Josh to come up and get ready for invitation this morning. And as we, as we close down, um, I just want to share with you, there, there, there are two main goals 
that I have in, in, in doing this series as we study it over the next few weeks. And the, and the first goal is this, is that we, we learn and understand the truth of what God's Word says about these hot topic situations. And two, that we take that knowledge out into the community and engage them with God's truth. Not just because, not just that's what I think, but because we can look at it and say, this is God's Word. This morning, in our time of invitation, if, if God has spoken to your heart and, 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 and there are some things that you need to talk with Him about, then I want to encourage you to come this morning to the altar and pray to Him. Uh, if there's a decision that, that, that you need to make, this is the best place to do it. If you need prayer, please, I would love to pray with you. Our deacons will be down here. They'd love to pray with you. If you're looking for a church home and you're considering Northside, please come down and talk with me. We, we would love to, to sit and talk with you and get to know you. And finally, this morning, if you have questions about what took place up in the baptistry, about what exactly brought Zachary to that place in his life, Please come and, and ask me. I, I, w- I would love to, to share that story with you. Stand with me this morning as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time today. Lord, I pray that you will bless the rest of the day's service. Lord God, as we come back to ordain James. Lord, I, I ask that as we study this series over the next few weeks, Lord, that you would give us insight and discernment, Lord, that you would speak so very clearly to our hearts. God, that you would challenge us to engage. Be with us now as we have our time of invitation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come forward as the Holy Spirit leads you.